My name is Aron Horvat. Today I will show you a few tricks, coding tricks with the, that are using the latest C sharp syntax, which means C sharp version 7, 8, 9, 10. The, uh, if you followed the new pieces of syntax, you must have noticed that there is a steady stream of functional syntactical constructs in C sharp that are being added and improved version to version. So now we have uh, a very powerful language in which we can freely mix paradigms. And that is what I will show you today, not, not exactly the syntax, but the mind process, the uh, designing and coding process that is mixing functional modeling with object-oriented modeling, with the uh, a touch of procedural when needed, so that you can write code quickly and make powerful and flexible designs. That is what, what new C-sharp additions are letting us do. You can download so source code. There will be a bit of source code to, to read. If you like, uh, this is the address. And uh, while I take a photo of, of this code, uh, these are all the slides I, I prepared for you. Sorry for this. Um, everything else will be code. One more note. I will be demonstrating designing with C Sharp. And if you want to show off a language feature or a bunch of them. Uh, what you normally do is, is not to take a business application because everybody would fall asleep by the end of this uh, demo. Uh, and half of the demo would take uh, introducing you to whatever business I, I had in mind. Uh, for demonstration purposes, when you want to show the language, the best way to do that is, I found, is to, is to use a board game any board game, because everybody understands them. And the trick with this approach is that if you ever wanted to, uh, uh, to program a board game, you would not do it the way I will show you here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, that will show you the power of uh, C-sharp features that we have today. This is the view component of a uh, Blazor WebAssembly application, you don't need to, to know any of those, but it would probably amuse you to see what they can do in only a few lines of code uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to work with them. Anyway, uh, what you saw in this board are UI elements that will need to have a backing model. These X's and O's, and you will see these two bluish Uh, cells that can be clicked. They shouldn't be uh, here present, but I have added them for you to see. Uh, so that is the third element, and we have a line. We have four elements that need to be modeled in the backing code. So this is the home and away cell component. We will need row and column where to draw them. Uh, then the winning line where to draw from and to four parameters. And uh, those blue cells that are clickable, they have a lambda what to do when somebody clicks them. So we need a backing model which does all this. I have just removed those clickable cells because the game is over and nothing should be clicked. We need something that would generate UI code like this. And then how do we do that? This is the backing model, the board, that will do all this and allow us to play the game. And this is the UI backing code. This is effectively the view model, which will hold a reference to the board model and do things to that. Display it, that is where WebAssembly will take over and simply display all the changes we make to the board on the screen, but we also need commands to restart the game and to make a move. So how do we implement this backing model? 
The crux of this presentation will be on designing on a designing method which is trying to quickly prototype a domain model. You need a quick prototype to see that everything works, that everything you had in mind can be done, that it can be tied to that view model seen on the screen. And when I do quick prototyping, and I do it all the time, I constantly use tuples, which have been around for quite a few years already. You can organize your data into tuples so to avoid introducing new classes. One problem we have in all strongly typed languages is proliferation of classes. In a normal project, we would have thousands of classes, and on every 1,000 classes, maybe 800 of them would be this large. And when you start designing a model, you, you don't want to design, I don't know, five or 10 classes just to show those four elements on the screen. Use tuples and draw them. Here in the view model, or in the view, that is, look what I can do. I can iterate through variable variables of type tuple, home, and then reference home.row, home.call. Do you know how these row and call symbols are uh, resolved? When you assign a variable or return a value that is a tuple, tuple e is very close to a read-only array. It, has, uh, it is implementing iTuple interface, uh, which is only giving you the indexer and the count, nothing more. And uh, the information about names is lost in the process. So how does the compiler know component names later? It knows th those through metadata. Whenever you assign a variable or return a value that is tuple, metadata remember the names of its components. And so you can refer back to them. But you don't have to assign any variable. You can use what is called tuple uh, deconstruction. You can assign a tuple into something that looks like a tuple, but it's effectively two variables two separate variables that have been uh, declared and assigned in this line. So in the line below, you don't need anything home dot anything. You know, you just have two variables, row and column. And uh, if you want to spare yourself some three, four, four <laughs> letters, <laughs> you can uh, use var keyword in front of the tuple and again both variables would be declared and set in every iteration. Then, this is not where deconstruction into tuples ends. Anything that can be deconstructed into a tuple can be used as a source for multiple variables that you can assign then, and we will meet the constructors in, in just a minute. Also, notice what I told you. I have named components row and call here and row and column here. Those two are separate. So you can assign to whatever you need over there and produce whatever you can over here and those two things will work very well. Okay, I'll do the same for away moves add a, a loop, and then by the way, I have started uh, .NET Watch Run so that whenever I save code, uh, this page will refresh, which didn't happen yet, or I missed something, maybe I missed it. Uh, so whatever we add to code will uh, in only a few seconds show up in, in the browser as well. So, 
The next thing is this. Look at this. I will have to de-zoom a little. Can you see this code? This is very important part. Multi-level tuple deconstruction. You can deconstruct a tuple of tuples, if that's what you like. And it will work, because any component can also be a tuple recursively. And the result of assigning this tuple of tuples is the appearance of four independent variables that I can use inside the loop. And uh, back here, I will have to de-zoom again. Now look at this terrible, terrible signature. An I enumerable of tuples of tuples. Now, this is the result of quick prototyping. Uh, when you start using tuples and func delegates to write, let's say, for the first time, this is the functional piece of code, to write functional code, uh, ugliness will sneak in very quickly. Your code will start to inflate in signatures. And all that for the sake of uh, shrinking on a number of classes. So you have to think which one of those goals is, is uh, more important to you. In the quick prototyping phase, I normally sustain this. I say, all right, I will survive this 80 characters of a declaration of a single variable. I will survive that. But later, I will surely add a class which wraps these four variables in, into an object, so to um, reduce the size of this signature. Anyway, uh, this will work. If you observe, there was a compile time error at the end of this line, but now it's gone. Everything compiles fine, which means that uh, multi-level deconstruction of tuples works well, and com uh, compiler knows very well what I meant with this code. Last, playable cells. There will be none. There will be an empty sequence of those. So right now, we have a complete... Here is the UI, which is simply drawing those clickable cells, tying them with that lambda that makes a move. We have an entire query model in only 20 lines of code. I have covered all the queries for the UI without defining any class except the, the core model class. We can add commands now and already, as I said it, that there is a clear separation between uh, queries and commands in this model. If you want to uh, design functional models which are quick to design, and uh, they will save you a lot of troubles later, then you will probably wish to separate queries which turn out to be just expressions that calculate the result from, from the backing state, from commands, which will, in fact, return a new instance of the model. So right now we are all the way into, into functional design. How many of you are uh, acquainted with the, the functional design? One, two and a half, two and a half. Well, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is how, is how easy it is to uh, design a class which is separating expressions that return values from the backing state so that nobody knows what that backing state is, and currently I don't even have a backing state, from commands that you are issuing, and all those commands must correspond to some action that triggers them, like there are buttons on the screen to play on this or on that uh, position, or to restart the game, or to initially load it, 
this is the initial loading of the game, there will be a restart of the game and making the move. Those are the actions that we do on our, on our board model. So here I will just expose a static initialize method which is hiding away the construction, which currently has nothing to do. And uh, these are the restart and make move actions on the UI, which must have something that corresponds to them in the model. And functional design is to make the board immutable and when restarting, just create a new board that is sufficient in this uh, situation and playing would also create a new board right now i don't have any implementation for playing the moves but i will add them in the prototyping phase i will say whatever somebody clicked on the screen let's do nothing just avoid throwing exceptions and things like that and we have an empty prototype for a class which allows all queries and all commands for the tic-tac-toe game played on, on the screen. These, this is the view model. It will initialize using the static constructor. It will restart the board by setting the new board in the UI. So this is the view model, it is mutable, but the domain model is immutable. I might say I am a tad disappointed that there are so uh, few of you who are using uh, functional modeling in the domain. I think at least that you should uh, investigate that and read a bit because when applied to more complex applications than this toy, uh, they pay back uh, a lot. They are making many typical mistakes impossible, many typical bugs cannot even be made, and I have, uh, uh, if I don't forget, I will give you a hint what can be done with, a, with an immutable domain model in this uh, toy demo that can be done with mutable uh, implementation of this same board but with code that is this large and requires hours of debugging. And it is like three minutes of coding with immutable uh, domain model. Making a move will delegate to the play method, but observe every method is returning a new board object and UI is the only mutable component here. So this completes the entire prototype. If you watched me work on a business application, I would do the same thing. Really. Because it is so simple. And it lets me see the effects of my actions on the screen. I have saved everything. This should be... This is not refreshed. What is this? Yes. The blue squares are... Uh, the blue squares are away because the game is over. They should not appear and they are not appearing. So my prototype is currently working fine. And now comes the second phase where we discover the new classes so that we can enhance our domain model. So the result is the immutable class, which is using sequences and tuples, which are 100% functional programming uh, artifacts. Everything I use here is functional, and still the whole application is object-oriented, clearly, because it's using the object-oriented view model over there that is consuming a functional uh, domain model from, from this place. Let's start introducing classes then. We see that row and column al always uh, operate together. How many of you have used record types so far? Two, so from 2.5 we are down to two. 
uh, record types are an excellent tool. And you will see, instead of saying a, a class, you would say a record. Uh, record is implementing value typed equality for us, and it is implementing properties for us. You will see that in just a minute. So instead of using a tuple, you would probably choose to use an object of a class which at least carries strong typing requirements. So uh, tuples are, have the same problem as func delegates in C sharp and actions. Uh, you can assign them to anything that corresponds to the same signature. Which means that you can, for example, in, in this game, you can make a terrible mistake by assigning x, y coordinates to row and column uh, coordinates. The problem in that is that x and y should be uh, switched, you know, and that is a bug uh, if you forget to do that. Uh, and if you do forget to do that, compiler is not going to see it for you. Uh, tuple assignment and func delegate assignment and action uh, delegate assignment accept anything that uh, satisfies the, uh, the signature. And we already have a strongly typed language, C Sharp, which has um, static code analysis, um, <laughs> the best one that exists, a compiler. And uh, we should use that power after the prototyping phase to introduce strong names, that is classes, to concepts that will control assignment for us and uh, let us avoid bugs. But now I have a problem. I cannot create a, in this prototype, I'm still showing, a, um, displaying a fixed content on the, sc on the screen, but I cannot do that uh, here because I cannot assign tuples to cells. There's another concept that can help us. How many of you recognize distinction between subclassing and subtyping? This is a trick question. Uh, when you subclass, then they are. And even if you implement an interface, they are. But look at this. If you, for example, define a, an implicit or explicit operator, then you can turn, you can turn a tuple into an object of a class. And then what is the subtyping relationship between tuples and this class? If you can assign a tuple of two integers to cell, it means the tuple of two integers is a subtype of cell, right? Subtyping is a set relationship. When talking about types, types will define a set of objects of that type. And then, a subtype is a subset of that set. So subtype are special objects that are also uh, part of that larger type. Subclassing is subtyping, obviously, but subclassing is more about inheritance. And I like to say that subclassing is an inheritance relationship, and I'm not sure that I invented that sentence. Uh, and subtyping is a set relationship, and I like to think in terms of types, because I tend to avoid inheritance. Because when you inherit implementation, that's it. That's what you get it is much easier for you to use behavior that you need as a component. And that is that old principle, favor object composition over class inheritance. You can always, uh, you can always uh, pack a few components of certain types and those types can implement certain interfaces so that you can uh, 
thick concrete classes which you will use to, to construct an object at runtime. With subclassing, you cannot do that. It is fixed at compile time, and you cannot change the structure of, of a class. So this was a long uh, piece of talk about types, but uh, implicit operators are a typical um, syntactic syntax that helps you implement subtyping without subclassing. And you see, this is compiling fine now. And uh, please don't do this in your code. <laughs> Uh, this is very dangerous because now any tuple of two integers is assignable to cell and it will silently convert to cell and you might not be aware of that. I have seen a library uh, that, that had to do with some networking which had an implicit conversion to string, which was not to string, but an implicit operator, because they wanted to push anything through the wire. And what happened in one place was that uh, somehow I cannot, now I cannot remember the exact code what happened, but somehow to string was invoked. And uh, the element which expected string coming from an implicit operator which did the whole bunch of um, um, constructed uh, the entire message from an object, now it was just a uh, name of the type. And the software uh, broke down and they, they were looking for bug for about two days. Because Nobody knew that toString was invoked, and nobody even knew that there is an implicit toString operator. So, be very careful about a feature like this. I am using a feature like this in testing, where, as you can witness, uh, it takes no time to construct a testing set, for example. But since you cannot define an operator in a piece of code which does not belong to either of these two types. You cannot create a third type and define this implicit operator on that one. I'm usually doing this same thing uh, using uh, uh, an extension method, like to sell, which is applied to the tuple. And then again, if you tried functional programming with C-sharp, if you gave it a try, you would see that, uh, that many operations there are implemented as extension methods that are applied to a certain type. And that technique, which I'm intensively using in testing, but not in, in production code, is again making my code very readable, very short and effective, so I can make an, a sequence of tuples and then say, just convert this to cells, and I have a test case. And now comes the trick question. Why does this compile? Over here, I have returned a sequence of cell objects. And over there, I'm consuming a sequence of integer, integer tuples. Yes, because cell here is a record. And so we come to the question, what the record type is and why you should use it. If I wanted to use a class, there would immediately appear a couple of compiled time errors. Because, for one thing, I'm missing properties. Record is declaring public read-only properties for us. It is declaring a public constructor which accepts two components and sets those properties in the order of appearance. Then the other thing, uh, it implements I equitable of cell. Strongly typed I equitable, you know that it is 
good if you need equality tests. It is good to implement this interface because it is uh, avoiding uh, type check. The general uh, equals from system.object is accepting an object and then it must uh, check its type. So it has a get hash code. This is fairly new. Uh, hash code static class with combine static uh, method. How many of you have been using this in practice? How many of you? One. So we are down to one. <laughs> uh, and how many of you had the, the opportunity to implement to override get hash code in practice? I suppose many, yes. At least half of you. So this is common. And you know about um, XORing, about multiplying integers by 17, uh, removing um, overflow checks and things like that. Forget that. Start using this. Because this, uh, this static method is doing that better than any of us here can do in most occasions. They know what they're doing. I, for example, have no idea what I'm doing when I create my own hash functions. Then, what does the record do? It implements general equals and it implements strongly typed equals. In C Sharp 10, you can create record structs. In C-sharp 9 and 8, uh, only reference-typed uh, records are supported. When you declare a record struct, you will get something that is almost identical to a common struct, because you know the struct uh, also has value-typed equality implemented. But in structs, it is implemented via reflection, which is slow. And if you declared the same thing as record struct, compiler would jump in and generate specific members for you, which are as fast as one can get. There's no faster method than that. So this is what record means, except one thing. If you notice, this should not compile. Yes, there is a compile time error. Deconstruction into a tuple does not work. You must implement your own deconstructor in your custom class, which is doing the opposite process from the constructor. It, uh, it sets output variables. And now you have it all. Deconstructors appeared a couple of years ago, but I actually never wrote a single deconstructor ever. What I did was to start records when they appeared and then to use this. Because record is looking like a tuple, but it has a name, a class name, so there is no uh, room for questions. Did I assign the right thing? Yes. If it compiles, yes. Uh, and it also has deconstruction so that if I wanted to use it in a functional style, like in UI, I don't want to bother with classes or anything, and I just need row and column, I can do that as well. Simply said, Okay, this works now. All right. All this code, all this from line 5 to 33, that's some 27, 8 lines of code. No, to 31, 25 lines of code is a word record. And that is the reason why you should use records. Yes? Is it immutable? Sorry? Yes, it is immutable. You can make it mutable if you want. Uh, I also think it has uh, init uh, setters, 
so that you can initialize uh, once with curly brackets, uh, but not change later. So it is uh, immutable after construction. So I can use the cell here. Nope. All right. What about this? A tuple of tuples. Let's define a class which is the line which has two components, two cells, line from and to a cell. And you will see that line is also declared as a record as well. It has two components. Therefore, it is decomposable into a tuple of tuples here. It is recursively decomposable, deconstructable, not de de decomposable. But then we have a problem in this uh, design. Cells are not really constrained, except that I forgot to check bounds, but we can do that. Lines have a more strict constraint if you look at the board, you cannot draw a line which goes from the uh, bottom left corner to the middle cell. That line is, is invalid. So this is the example where we have where what record or what, what a com compiler generates for us is not what we need. We need a custom constructor. Even better, I have a better idea. We, we might uh, introduce static uh, factory functions and hide the constructor away so that nobody can just generate a line. No, tell us what, row, column, diagonal, anti-diagonal. There are four kinds of them, so we need effectively four distinct constructors. What do you do with the record? You are free to implement anything you want from those standard elements of a class and still call it a record. You see, it is still a record. Compiler will notice your members and just don't do anything about those. However, what I did here is to implement a private constructor and public deconstructor. So you can always read, but you cannot write whatever you like in here. Please observe that there are no exceptions anywhere here. I'm plugging all the holes for invalid objects except testing boundaries. Uh, and uh, I'm creating a functional design which is uh, which leaves no room for a bug. I have no other way to tell you this. If you create this, uh, if you create classes in this style, there will be no place to plant a bug. I had a colleague in, in the office who came one day and said that uh, uh, his daughter asked him what he was doing uh, so late at work. And he said, I was, I was removing bugs from code. And she said, why did you put bugs there? So that's the point. Functional design is reducing bug count, at least in my case, from my experience, by an order of magnitude. So back to records. I had to implement the constructor because once I took over the constructor, compiler moves away and says, okay, your job. I don't know what properties you mean to expose. I have exposed properties. I have initialized them in the constructor. So it's also my job to expose a deconstructor. However, equality members and I equitable of line and everything is still generated by the compiler here. And then comes the crux of this, the pinnacle of this design. I want to have static factory functions for a row, which is calculating correct values for all those four variables. Then for the column, 
than for the diagonal and anti-diagonal, two ugly and complicated ones where you have uh, plus minus one bug opportunity. So we have four static factory functions. As you can see, you can add anything you like into a record. It is a class like any other. You can add your own methods. You can add methods that are calculating something that are changing, uh, not changing by creating uh, a, a new record object. It is just a regular class into which compiler will inject some 20, 30 lines of code for you. And so, look at this. Do you remember the prototype? Look, disgusting. Nice. That's the difference. So, you will uh, use all those uh, syntactic elements, functional syntactic elements, to prove that your, that your ideas work. But after that, before you commit and uh, head for the bar while your code is uh, traveling towards production, you'll probably want to make sure that your classes are statically typed and verifiable. You will introduce proper domain models for, for all those tiny elements that were missing. Okay, this still works. There should be no compile time error, and I cannot use a mouse on this glass. No. Okay, no compile time error. Multi level deconstruction works very well, even with your record classes. But now, maybe I wanted to use proper domain models here to avoid confusion in the UI. Again, everything has assumed a strong name that is, again, verifiable by the compiler. So you have an opportunity to move your design in small steps and to improve it. But still, all the time, since the very beginning, this is the same design. It changed very little in the way it, it operates. All right. What about this? Uh, yes. Uh, playable cells are in the board. Playable cells are tuples. My implicit operator is, has jumped in. And this is the moment when I start fearing for my safety because I'm not sure that I expected that to happen. So this is probably the moment when you will go to this prototype and tell, all right, thank you very much, and uh, at least comment it out or uh, delete it. No. Question. Yes? In line what? Oh, I don't know, and I'm not sure that I would like to have it. I don't know. I mean, that, that means that um, uh, one, uh, one thing is applied in, in multiple places. Yes, but uh, I mean, I would prefer uh, an extension method or an explicit operator in place of uh, that, so that all those places that need it uh, would refer to that single implementation rather than copy its body over there, if you know what I mean. Okay, so now I have to fix this. And uh, okay, now we come to a more advanced. All right, I will, uh, I will return this because I still haven't removed these prototyping elements from here. So I still need it. But in five minutes time, we should remove this, definitely. Okay. Now this is functional programmer in me showing all that I know on this piece of code, what are the playable cells? Now you start thinking about expressions. How do we calculate playable cells? If there are any winning lines, 
then there are no playable cells empty. Otherwise, take the full board, nine cell elements. This will be an I enumerable of cell. I don't have it yet, but I see the design. I will put them here. So this is just an ugly expression that returns nine cell objects with unique coordinates. If you never saw functional C-sharp, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I have to make it easy for you. But anyway, if you take an I enumerable of cell representing the entire board, then just say, except moves. These are the cells that were never played. And the user should be able to click them. I don't have the moves sequence yet, but listen, why will this work? Because of equality testing operators that were implemented for me. That's the point. And I'm using records all the time because all those this large classes, those hundreds of this large classes in my code, they're all testable for equality and I can use them in collections as keys to dictionaries. In hair sets, I can, I can check whether there are duplicates. Anything I need when developing a complex domain model, I can do because equality testing becomes a native feature of my objects. And I can write one line of code like this and it will do a complicated operation. Then, what are these moves? If you are developing an immutable model, then you will probably need immutable collections. How many of you have been working with immutable collections? Oh, that's better. Okay. Immutable collections come with a cost, an added cost. They have logarithmic, uh, added logarithmic time on everything where common collections have uh, unit time. So it is n logarithm n time to uh, add n elements to a list, not O of n. Uh, so these collections have a cost. So you will avoid creating huge immutable objects, like thousands of items inside. But if you have nine items inside, performance penalty will be negligible, but design uh, effects will be great. I will have an immutable domain model all the way through. So, when you design an immutable class, functional style, which includes a collection, it will, this will become your muscle memory then. Create a private constructor which receives an immutable collection of all the content, then initialize it to an empty immutable collection the first time. And whenever you want, okay, just repeat that, whenever you want to add to that collection, create a new, that will be this helper method below, uh, use the collection to add, con oh no, no, this is something totally different, forget. This is the line I, wanted, I, I was talking to you. I was telling, uh, create new collection by adding an element to it. Immutable collections return a new collection with one element added and the old reference uh, remains intact. Nothing changes in that. And then create a new instance of your object with the new collection inside of it. And this expression which I'm constructing here, do you know what it's doing? If I wanted to play on this cell, that cell might be occupied. So what I'm doing, or better yet, functional programming, tiny uh, uh, functional programming in me, is searching through all the playable cells which are equal to this one, and there can be only one such uh, cell, converting that one into a new board, Otherwise, rejecting the move by doing nothing. This is homework for you, for those of you who never saw 
uh, functional expressions and just return the first one of these. It's either a played uh, board or the same board as this one, so it either accepted or rejecting the, it rejected the move. You can even choose to throw exceptions from, from this operator, but there is no default if empty operator that accepts a lambda yet, so you cannot just throw an exception here. Okay, this is advanced functional programming in C-sharp, if you like, uh, start thinking about it. We only need to implement home and the wave moves and the game will work. This picks all moves that have an even offset. Those are the moves made by the home player. But this is ugly. This is complicated, this is error prone, and I will have to duplicate it here with only a single, this zero uh, switch to one. If you already have a functional model which is uh, based on uh, sequences, equitable objects, things like that, you can start designing your own link extensions, like that default if empty that receives a lambda. A lazy default if empty, which does not exist in .NET yet. How do you do that and why do you do that? One is to move all the ugly code under the rug. So you just create an extension method, put it somewhere else, and put all the ugly code in there, and just hide it behind a, a nice name. That is one reason. The other reason is that if you placed this code somewhere else, then you start asking why am I using link to implement this when it is not efficient enough. Link is semi-nicely looking. It is, I don't know, if, you, if I had names, if I, if I had methods for these operations, this expression would really look nice. It would be a select uh, this method where that, uh, prop, um, that method that returns Boolean uh, select this uh, conversion, you know, and it would be a really nice uh, expression, a chain of, of link operators. With all the lambdas, it is ugly and it is not really efficient. So, this is better and this is procedural. Take the enumerator, if parity is greater than zero, which is one, uh, move, skip the first element, then skip twice per iteration. Job done. And this is the most efficient way to do that. However, this method is accepting parity. So I can say, put parity 1000 here, which is not valid. So what you do in a uh, design which is safe from bugs, you would create a private extension method which is very efficient and expose two static public methods that are giving a name to those parameters, like where even offset, where odd offset, and you would fix the parameter. And this is good. Now you go back to this code and implement it this way. And what do you say now? All that ugliness has been moved away, turned into a better implementation and hidden away from everyone so that nobody can make a mistake. Winning lines, advanced plus level. Look at this. I could use a line to expose some helper method which tells me lines formed by these cells. And whenever cells form a line of three, that is the winning line, all right? So I need home players winning lines, away players winning lines. This is the expression that calculates that. So, another ugly. Expression, 
in the line, which is doing a very complicated deliberation by grouping lines which are equitable so they, they can be grouped by themselves and every cell should tell us to which lines it belongs. Can you follow this? Does anybody can follow this? Maybe? But if you started thinking this way, if you start thinking like my entire domain model splits into querying and commanding to it, so forget commands, querying is a bunch of expressions. There are no loops, there are no nothing, just an expression. What is the formula for what this function says it will return? Use expression body syntax all the way through, never see curly braces. I'm, I'm not sure that there are any curly braces in this code except in that extension method and over there in maybe in the, in the UI. In the domain model, it's all um, arrows, expression body syntax. So the idea is to ask every single cell to which lines it belongs, then to group those lines and count all the groups that have three elements. Those are the winning lines. You see, that is the expression for winning lines. And all I need is the cell, this is the cell class, to tell me that it belongs to this row, to this column, maybe to this diagonal, and maybe to this anti-diagonal. So it returns two, three, or four elements. And that expression over there, once I add a link, will compile and work fine. I will save this. These are the elements. I think that everything is in place, but I cannot use this mouse on this glass. So, where are you? I can play. I have already made a mistake, the fork attack. And while I'm mis uh, winning, the, the last element which I promised to you, what can be done with this immutable domain model that is very hard to be implemented if board model were mutable? Yes? Undo. Undo, very good idea and much simpler than my idea. <laughs> yes, undo, you would just show the previous version of the board and you're done. And there is, there is the whole bunch of algorithms that are uh, based on that same ability. For example, if I wanted to play against the computer, I would have to search for states. Now, every state is a single board object. You see? With Mutable board, if any of you ever implemented a board game with a mutable domain model, I did that on a much more complicated board game than this, and it was hell. With this, it is two lines of code, literally. So, I hope you enjoyed this. I have won the game. If you have any questions, you can ask them now. Yes. There is the with expression where uh, where you say with this object, open curly braces and just set that one property. Uh, that will construct a new object with the modified that single value and everything else just copied. So that is with records. Yes. You can implement that on your own within its syntax, and uh, there is a lot of complexity in that, in doing that manually. But it works out of the box with records. Yes? My experience is that it, that, uh, it is probably best to start 
small. You can always create one small class that is functional, that is immutable, that separates commands from queries and uh, <coughs> works in this way. It will not uh, make any troubles to all other classes in the domain. And then you build from that and keep building. You will see that there are uh, more and more things that you can do that were very hard without that. For example, multithreading, task parallelism. This is task parallel ready with no, no, no zero lines of code to use it in, in task parallelism. If I made this not only mutable, but if I use a mutable list inside, it does not guarantee that every single bit will remain intact, even if nobody is changing it. It does not, it explicitly says that they don't guarantee it. If I use it in uh, task parallel expression, would it work? Would it explode later? I don't know. With, if I had a bunch of classes that were designed in this way, months ago, I would just say, yes, everything is safe. I don't have to think. Yes? Yes, that is a good question. What about memory? We are using many small objects, many, many, many small objects. <clears throat> that is not a problem for garbage collected uh, languages because garbage collection is very efficient in that mode. If it has many small objects, it, uh, do you know how it works? It has a pointer to, to the free location and it adds new objects on, uh, at the end. When garbage collection happens, none of these will be visited because there are no references to them. They are all forgotten, except a couple of those that are still alive. Those that are alive will be copied to the beginning, compacted, and everything else remains just to move the pointer that is a single assignment operation. So all the other objects, all the other short-living objects are just skipped. It costs zero to garbage collect them. All right, if you have anything else, I will be around. Uh, we can talk. I would also like to hear your, uh, <laughs> your experience. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference.